morning. And you also failed to mention, I live in the Dalles. Okay. <laughs> so, and it is so great to be able to go past the airport and be able to give the presentation and get home tonight and watch my son play baseball. So, really happy. And there's, there's a lot of synchronicity, actually, between my life and the event uh, today. My uh, field of operation has largely been um, in, in, uh, dedicated, as, as Shannon said, to translating and uh, making Chris Argus' work uh, accessible and practical. And for those of you that are not aware of Chris Arduous, he uh, is considered the father of learning organizations. Uh, he was a uh, professor, a social scientist at the Harvard Business School and Ed School, and I had a great privilege of knowing him uh, during his time on Earth. And most of my work has been with, um, uh, you know, uh, working with teams, one-on-one -on -one coaching and small group workshops. And it's just been recently that I realized that I've been doing this for a while. In fact, 22 years to be exact. And I've seen a lot of stuff. I mean, I've been in the middle and on every single side of a difficult conversation, as you can imagine. And as I'm, if you can tell, approaching my retirement years, I thought maybe it's time to kind of pull together some of my observations of what I've seen and share it with a larger setting. And so I really very much appreciate this opportunity to come and kind of share with you what I've observed. And I'm going to take you on kind of a whirlwind tour of what I've observed as we come together and hold business conversations and achieve either our intended or undesired results. And conversations do have results. We either get things done or we don't. We reach decisions or delays. Our conversations can bring us to a mutual agreement or a stalemate. Our conversations can strengthen working relationships or weaken them. All in due in part to how we think and act together. Now, April Mills ended her presentation with a challenge. I'm going to begin my presentation with a challenge to you. I expect, and I'm not going to be at all surprised, if during my presentation you start thinking of somebody else, okay? And you might be thinking, oh, I wish she was here. She really needs to hear this, <coughs> my wife. Um, <laughs> or, or, you know, he always does that, my husband. You know, two good candidates that you might be thinking. So I'm not going to be at all surprised if you think that, or of some of your maybe colleagues or boss or whatever. That's perfectly normal, because we as humans suffer from a, a symmetry of awareness. It's always so much easier to see how others act, and we lack the awareness of how we act. And so what I, the challenge I have for you is, as we go through it, if you find yourself thinking about somebody else, fine, just catch yourself. Take a reflective moment and then pivot to, well, how do I think and act that way? And if you're able to do that, then half the battle is won in terms of being able to help you get to a place where you'll have better results from your conversations. And to kind of double down on April's uh, uh, first presentation, the greatest leverage for change is your own thinking and actions. So let's take the tour. Oops. Keep calm and be polite. I remember I worked with Herman Miller for a number of years, and I was in, in uh, Michigan, and the, one of the executives said, you know, our biggest problem is we're too Michigan nice. And he went on to explain that, again, we're so polite with each other, we fail to address the real complex issues. We're not willing, we don't have the courage to really engage the difficult topics. And this is one of the things that I find in business is that we tend to be polite and diplomatic to a fault. Now, I want to say there's nothing wrong with being polite. We need a certain amount of politeness in our own civil discourse, but it has cost when it comes to business conversations. We 
we tend to have social values that, you know, are about being supporting, you know, so I, I, I really don't want to say because it might hurt your feelings or it, you might be embarrassed for the fact that I think differently than you and so I don't say it. So it inhibits our ability to engage. So we tend to tell people what they think and hear to help them feel good about themselves or we agree with them when others are acting in, improperly. And more so, we, we understand and see respect as being equal to not challenging someone's point of view. Let me give you an example. So let's say I say, I come up to you and say, hey, I tell you, Bob, my idea is going to really save the company. We've just recruited those alien beings that landed in my backyard yesterday. And Bob thinks, holy mackerel, that's the craziest idea that I've ever heard. But then Bob puts on his best you know, face, I'm listening face, and says, that's interesting, Bill. And of course, then I'm thinking, good, I got his attention. He's liking what I'm saying. So I say, well, yes, they, they, they all came from MBAs from Mars, of which then Bob thinks, time's a wasting. What do you think I am? Wall, you know, fly, uh, 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 fly paper for freaks? Of which then he acts and says, your idea is worth studying more. We'll pass it on to a subcommittee. Of which then I think, great, I got his buy-in. Now, again, let's be honest. I mean, this is called, this is what Chris Rogers calls the inconsistent message. I'm thinking, you know, w you know, what am I? Fly paper for freaks, but what comes out of my mouth is that interest. You've had that conversation, right? Okay? It's something that we all do. What we want to begin to start shifting to is a mutual learning of social values that we can attribute to people a higher capacity for self-reflection and self-examination. That if I make an error, either, you know, uh, in, in through executing something or in my interactions with it, I want to know about it, okay? I want to learn from it. Protecting me is not going to help my learning. As well as what's real critical to, uh, to, to offset this politeness is to learn how to increase your capacity to manage idea conflict. That is where I see that where we tend to have the greatest difficulties. We don't manage idea conflict well, and it eventually turns into relationship conflict. And so you have to increase your capacity to manage idea conflict. But this is usually what happens when we try to manage idea conflict. Here's my favorite cartoon from Calvin and Hobbes. Calvin says, when a person pauses in mid-sentence to choose a word, that's the best time to jump in and change the subject. It's like an interception in football. You grab the other guy's idea and you run the opposite way with it. The more sentences you complete, the higher your score. The idea is to block the other guy's idea and express your own. That's how you win. Hobbes says, conversations aren't contests. Okay, a point for you, but I'm still ahead. <laughs> okay. This is what, what I call the common cold of business conversations is the, 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 what, what the point counterpoint con, uh, 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 argument. But the way that it comes out is in this Western approach of what I call lock and loaded. Okay? So it's basically, it's listening for my turn to talk. Or I'm listening for the weakness so that I can attack your point. Again, let me just check. I've got some honest folks here in the room. Have you found yourself as you're in a conversation that you're not really listening to the other person, you're just waiting to take your turn? Or you're locking and loading. So what tends to happen then in this kind of what is point-counterpoint argument is that I act by pushing my view. I don't ask any questions of you. And I'm thinking, or, and, and, and B's thinking, I'm right, A is wrong, A's not listening, so I've got to explain my point. So A acts by pushing their view, making no inquiry, and pushes harder. A thinks I'm right, B's wrong, B's not listening, I've got to convince B, explain harder. And you begin to start seeing this loop. And yet, what's interesting about it it's that both people are thinking exactly the same thing and acting in very similar ways. What kind of results can you predict 
from, these conversations, you know, from this kind of conversation. Have you been in this kind of conversation? It's kind of like that Miller Lite commercial that we saw years ago. Tastes great, less filling. Tastes great, less filling. Right? The results is usually stalemate or escalated tension. You could pretty well predict that every time. It doesn't go anywhere. And it begins to escalate. Whoever screams the loudest and the hardest wins. Here's a shift. What we want to begin to start listening for is the reasonableness in the other person's thinking and being open to the possibility that he or she has a good point. It's amazing how the, the times that I've been caught in these kinds of conversations where if I, if I can catch myself and then just take a moment to acknowledge the other person's point of view without having to agree, it shifts the conversation. But I'm looking for the reasonableness in the other person's point of view. I'm also listening for the quality of the conversation. How are we holding the conversation correlates to how well we learn from each other. It has a particular kind of different way of thinking that says, that not that I'm, because I'm not going to ask anyone to give up being right, okay? But I do pivot to a different way of thinking. This is, what am I missing? And what am I missing may be in your point of view. So can I get curious enough to investigate that? And in so, can we learn from each other? Because what may be obvious to me is not to you, and what's obvious to you may not be to me. A different conversation happens. As well as also to listen to your internal voice. And this is usually what gets people caught up in terms of being polite. is because the way that your internal voice comes up in your head, you can't say that. Not a good idea. It's going to cause more upset or it could get you fired. Okay? And yet, if you don't say it, you're left feeling like you haven't really addressed the issue or you walk away with, you know, dropping the antacid. It's a basic human dilemma of communication. We're damned if we do, damned if we don't. What we're going to be doing tomorrow in, in creating productive business conversations is talking about that internal voice and how to move that internal voice from X-rated to PG, productive and generative. As well as also then looking at our own actions. I mean, this is the very, when you think of a conversation, a conversation is basically making a statement and asking a question. Now, most of the time when I'm in business meetings, observing, facilitating, there's an imbalance. There's a lot of advocacy, a lot of making statements, very little questioning going on. I, I, I did some work with Federal Express, and I remember I brought this up, and someone said to me, well, you've got to understand, we're Federal Express. We don't have time to ask questions. We've got to get things there overnight. What kind of organization, what kind of culture occurs when you don't have time to ask questions? A good question probes someone's thinking, and also invites challenge to your own. And a little phrase that Chris Argers used that I always love is that you have to be simultaneously aggressive and vulnerable with your point of view. All of you have valuable points of view. Get them out on the table. You want to raise them. But you also simultaneously want to be vulnerable enough to realize that you don't see everything. You might have missed something again. Okay? Or you could be just maybe a little wrong. You know? So you want to be vulnerable enough to be able to have your, your thing. And tomorrow again, we'll be looking at, again, what, what makes for a good advocacy? How do you balance it with, with inquiry to be simultaneously aggressive? You also have in your flash drive a much more explicit kind of cheat sheet in kind of uh, recipes, for lack of a better word, on how to kind of balance your advocacies and your inquiry. And we'll go more in detail at tomorrow. But again, the simple thing is about how can, in your conversation, can you disclose and make more transparent your thinking and how you got to, to the conclusions that you got, as well as balancing it with inquiry that is really genuinely getting curious about other people's perspectives. How do they see it 
different from you? What are you seeing that I am not? That kind of curiosity can create a different quality of conversation that at first feels like you're going slow, but it's one of those phenomena of it's you go slow in order to go fast later. Because again, going back to that point, counterpoint conversation, let me tell you, that's a real time waster. And if you get better at being able to really exercise these skills, you have better results, therefore more confidence, you use it more, and you get there quicker. Then there's authority, okay? Now, <laughs> we as human beings come together and organize ourselves in vertical structures where there is authority with various degrees of power. That constrains conversation. It's just the way it is. Let me give you a quick anecdote. I, from 2000 to 2013, one of my regular clients was in Saudi Arabia, so I traveled two or three times a year to Saudi Arabia. And I remember being at a conference once where the, the, the uh, CEO of the largest plastics refinery in Saudi Arabia got up and made a passionate plea to his vice presidents and the senior leaders that were gathered to disagree with him. And at the end, I got up and I said, you know, I bet that a lot of you as Mossad was given his presentation, inviting you to disagree with him, you were thinking to yourself, no way. No way. And one courageous vice president got up and said, you know, you're right. You got to understand, in Saudi Arabia, we're a culture where a monarch rules. And he's our king. And you never disagree with the king. And yet, during the break, many people came up to me and said, we have this little Arab idiom, and it goes, the king wants to go water skiing, start rowing. And they then talked to me about how wonderful Mossad, who encouraged a disagreement, was probably the most difficult person to work with because he always came up with the most ineffective ways to go about doing things and didn't listen to them. But they couldn't say that. It is very, very difficult. And for those of you that are in leadership position or have leaders with them, there's a certain dilemma that comes with the territory of being a leader. First of all, people in positions of authority are not always aware that they're doing things to make it difficult for others to disagree. And so you have to, as leaders, find some way to incentivize people to disagree with you, okay? Otherwise, you run the risk of sending mixed signals. So, uh, for example, I've been in a lot of organizations. Everyone, I, every leader I talk to says, oh, I've got an open door, open door. Anybody can agree with me, you know? No one has a sign that says, you know, if you disagree with me in public, you're fired. That's a policy. I've never seen that. And yet, in all those organizations, I hear time in and time in again, whatever you do, don't disagree with the boss. It's bad, you know. There's that kind of mixed signals that have developed. And again, each, in all of our different cultures, there are different uh, perceptions around authority that, again, constrain our ability to be able to have a conversation. So, you're always going to be in a position of having a certain basic dilemma when it, when it comes to considering different points of view than your own. So one of the ways that, that um, uh, you can begin to kind of disclose your view is to be able to kind of, you know, um, uh, it, to cue people that you have a view. Because if you don't disclose it, you know, and you say, okay, I want to, you know, everyone, let's all discuss and all that stuff and then it comes out later that you did have a view and you didn't say it, people are going to go, hey, what was that all about? You know, you should have just told me that in the first place and we would have done what you wanted to do. Um, and yet, if you don't share your views, it's less likely, or uh, just, it's less likely people are going to share their own. Or if you do share your own, you're going to get the salute and people are going to just say, yes, boss. So a lot of times what I recommend leaders to do is 
to be more transparent and kind of be able to say, I do have a view. I want to let you know that I have one, but I'm concerned that if I put it out there, it may unduly influence you, and I want to hear from you first. You know, at least, at least you're at least tipping them off that you're going to have that kind of discussion. And again, I'm not an advocate of leading by consensus. Very hard to do. One of the challenges I give leaders is that your main responsibility is to be transparent with how you got to the decision and the conclusion that you got to, so that, that you're clear and precise, that people understand how you got to it. And then also to share to what degree are you open to influence or not. I told you it's going to be a whirlwind tour. Relationships. They're the big elephant in the room. I don't know if you can see this. I'm right here in the room, and no one even acknowledges me. Okay? And every organization, and I would suspect that you're no different, relationships are hard to talk about because we get, we get personal. I mean, what's going on with so-and-so? I mean, you know, well, you, did you hear what happened here? You know, oh, boy, you know, they're not getting along. And, oh, boy, you know. And yet, people are clueless. I come in in so many organizations as an executive coach, and the person's been told that they got to get an executive coach because of some performance issue. And I sit down with the person and I say, do you know why I'm here? Nope. Clueless. Absolutely clueless, because no one's had the courage to be able to tell them what's going on. But everybody knows. Hmm? You've been there, huh? But again, this is where, again, I'm shifting a lot of my practice is really focusing on relationships because relationships are the context for considering organizational issues, making choices, co coordinating actions. Um, and they have a structure, and I'm going to show you that this uh, structure in, in a second in terms of how, how uh, things do it. And that people tend to get stuck in, st in these certain patterns. And if you get stuck on a content issue, if you find yourself going back and forth, there's usually a stuck relationship going on, and you always know the hallmark when you to hear yourself say, here we go again, or there he goes again, or there she goes again. Again, just a moment of honesty. Done that, been there, right? Hmm? The repetitive patterns have to do with a basic kind of structure that happens in our relationships. And it goes to that, again, asymmetry of awareness. The other acts, I can see your actions, but what you can't see is how I react. And the way I react then influences how I act, which leads you to have a reaction which I can't see, but influences how you act. And this basic is a basic structure that takes place within, within patterns of which neither can see. So what you want to be able to start moving towards in a more adaptive pattern where, again, I'm inquiring ab about what is it that I can't see, which is how you're reacting, how you're making sense of what I just said, as well as asking the question, hmm, in terms of, you know, what did I do that might have contributed to your reaction? How did you understand what I said? In what ways did I contribute to the difficulty at hand? Because I can't see that. I'm blind to that. You know, I, I had a woman, a, a friend of mine from college that was born blind. Never been in a relationship with someone who had been born blind. And so I, I asked, I said, well, what, what would be the you know, thing that would be helpful and what would I do that would be stupid? And I'll never forget her response. She said, you know, once you get to know me, you realize that being blind is the least of my problems. <laughs> she was absolutely right. Okay. But what I've discovered about myself as I've gotten older is my biggest problem is that I am blind. I am blind to your intentions. I can't see them. They're very, very deep, very complicated, very hidden. And yet I can think of all kinds of things, why I think you do have bad intentions, but I can't. I am basically blind to them. I'm also blind to how my actions impact you because I can't stand outside of myself and see myself. And that kind of thinking, to be able to kind of help that, can help you then if you could begin to start sharing with people, sharing with your working relationships, again, what you're not seeing and inquiring into what they see of you 
can work towards really creating much more adaptive working relationships. Okay, now to my favorite. This is a great, this is a tribute to Annie Lamott. My favorite phrase, my mind is a dangerous neighborhood. I'm not going in unarmed or alone. Okay, so I'm gonna give you again a very quick tour of our dangerous neighborhood that we call our human mind. What's lurking in this dangerous neighborhood? Mugged by false assumptions, held up by a stuck perspective, blindsided by overcottons, tr tricked by a fundamental attribution error, hijacked by emotional triggers, and run down by quick thinking. It's a dangerous neighborhood, which means that we have to be alert to these certain basic cognitive errors in order to catch ourselves. So they're gonna happen. Again, nothing wrong. This is normal. It's the way that our brains and minds are wired, but we have to develop the capacity to be able to detect when we are vulnerable to these cognitive errors. Let's take the first one. Mug by false assumptions. Assuming what the other means when a vague abstract language is used. Here's our wonderful penis car, uh, cartoon. Hey, Patty, how about giving me a push? Bong. Uh, which then she walks away and says, that was a strange thing to ask for. Okay, but doesn't that happen? I mean, again, when, when we tend to use vague and general um, language, we're gonna go and empower the team, it leaves us open to a very vast different interpretations of what that would actually look like. The other kind of way of uh, this happens is illustrated by this wonderful little video, little commercial. You know, what, what's interesting, if you notice, uh, the, the commercial says, don't judge too quickly. Uh, now, they were one of those subprime mortgage lenders who, uh, because they didn't judge quickly, got us into the mess that we did. But what I'm saying is that we do judge quickly, you know? I mean, from the vantage point, from what that, what that guy behind the desk saw and what he heard, it made perfect reasonable sense that he was getting robbed. The other poor guy with the pepper spray in his face is going, what, what's going on? Okay, that also happens in our daily interactions with each other. Given what you see and select, you're gonna come to some conclusions very quickly and act. And it may be very different from what the other person is seeing and reacting to. Or held up by a stuck perspective. Now this is a very famous uh, picture. So I just want to just check because it's a larger group. Has any, can I get a raise of hands for anyone who has not seen this image? Because it's a very popular image. Okay, I see a couple. Okay, just for very quickly. So all those of you seen it, just hold on for a second, I'll get to you. For those of the right over here, what do you see? It's a picture of a woman, old or young. How many people see a picture of a young woman? Okay. How many people see a picture of an old woman? Oops, what do we got here? All righty. Same image on the thing, but we've got some people seeing young, some seeing old. Now, what I, for those of you who've seen this, I want you to remember the first time you saw it and how you tended to only see the old woman and you couldn't see the young woman. Now, I want to make up some time here. So again, for, for those of you that you're seeing the old woman, you're noticing the the mouth is below, the nose is the, is, is what the, is the young woman's chin, um, the eye is, is actually the other young woman's ear, and then you've got the hair. Can, can those of you that are seeing, you know, can you begin to start switching back and forth or you're still having difficulty seeing both the old and young woman? Who, who's still having difficulty seeing both the old and young woman? Okay, you're stuck. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> And that happens all the time, okay? And I'll, and I'll have, sit and discuss among your table. We'll pull that back. You can figure it out later. But, but again, you're stuck. And we also get stuck with our perspectives. We particularly get stuck with our perspectives of each other in terms of our working relationships. You know, you begin to start building up kind of an interpretive strategy, a perspective of the other person that you're working with and you're gonna only particularly see the bad behavior that confirms that's that perspective and you'll deselect the others, okay? And they're doing it to you. 
And we tend to get stuck in these perspectives. We get stuck in the perspective within our functions within an organization. Finance is going to see things in a particular way. IT is going to see things in a particular way. Operations are going to see things in a particular way. And we tend to get stuck. What we have to begin to start doing is learn how to toggle back and forth from perspectives. Like you can toggle back and forth of seeing the old woman and the young woman. Blindsided by overconfidence. So here's our problem is because we are such efficient thinkers, when we come to our conclusions, they feel obvious, okay? I mean, again, little moment of honesty. Have you ever been in that conversation? You know, and, you're, and the voice goes off in your head, it's obvious, why can't you see it, stupid? Huh? Yeah. We do it. And that, and that's just part of the nature is that, that we, we jump to our conclusions so quickly that, that there's an aura of just obviousness to them. And so we tend to see ourselves as absolutely right and the other being wrong. And we state our conclusions as a fact. Okay, this is really critical, is that we tend to state our conclusions as fact. This company is going to hell in a handbasket. The morale is shot. Okay? Now, what I failed to do is to share and, and realize that my conclusion is inferential that it's the end product of a reasoning process based on something observable. That's the fact. But I've drawn a conclusion, an inference, but I'm stating that as a fact. And then, of course, we expect others to see the obviousness of our thinking. Why aren't you getting it? Okay? And the difficulty is that we do then miss something. We can literally be blindsided by this overconfidence. Again, I'm not asking anyone to give up being right, all right? I'm just saying to be aware of that degree in which there's that, that, that overconfidence, that absoluteness. I'm absolutely, completely right. And then we're obviously many times tricked by a fundamental attribution error. Okay, this is a cognitive uh, error that happens a lot, is I'm okay, you're not. Uh, that even though I screwed up, you know, wh when I screw up, you know, I've got good reasons, I had the best intentions, um, you know, but on the other hand, when you do something difficult, mm, I got all kinds of explanations. Like I, for myself, I have, I have two boys. I'm convinced that they would get up every morning for a strategy meeting and say, what are we going to wreck of dads today? <laughs> huh? You know? Now, of course they weren't, because my wife always had to remind me they're just being kids, they're just being teenagers. But again, that tendency is like, why would you do something that would make my life so difficult? You've got to have bad intentions. Huh? Yeah, and I got all kinds of elaborate theories and explanations as to why you're acting the way that you are. But me? Why? No, I had, I had good intentions. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do it. Okay? There is that, again what they call a fundamental attribution error. So you want to begin to start shifting, and it's a big shift to start attributing positive intent to people. Now, I know all of you, I'm sure, come to work, and none of you come to work going, I think I'm going to make April's day hell. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> no, you don't do that. You come, you come together to work with your best intentions but you're blind in seeing how that maybe some of your behavior, some of your actions, what you say and what you do, may cause difficulties for others that you're not aware of. It's having an impact. Then there's being hijacked by our emotional reactions. Because again, we are human people, we come to work, we come to this organization, and we bring our own emotions. And here's a little video to illustrate this point. I love her laugh, it's a great laugh. So now, the point here is that for, that for that gentleman, he thought he was under attack, all right? And he responded appropriately so, got out of the way, became defendant. That also happens that when we get into conversations where, again, what Chris Argus calls the conditions of threat and embarrassment arise, that my competency is being questioned, 
my thoughts are being challenged, one can have an experience of feeling threatened or potentially embarrassed, and a certain defensive reaction kicks in. Now, the critical thing is to figure out whether it's truly attack or one of these. So just quickly, you know, quick, quick, a quick antidote. I was facilitating a meeting out in Wasco County. At the end of the meeting, this guy stands up and says, how much do they pay you? And I was a little shot across the bow. I mean, he did it with a big crowd, you know. And I wanted to say, hell, a lot more money than you make, you know. <laughs> Couldn't say that. Wouldn't be polite, you know. But what these skills have taught me is to bracket my defensive reaction long enough to get curious. So I asked him, I said, so um, what did you see me do during the course of the meeting that would lead you to question my value? I want your resume. Uh, okay, well, if I give you my resume, how would that help you establish uh, my value? I want to show it to somebody. I said, okay, last question, I promise. Wh who would you show it to? And his face got all red, it was a man about my age, he said, I didn't want to tell you this, but my mother. At that moment, my heart melted. And he went on to explain that he was a simple well driller, that he wasn't a really, he'd never seen a PhD facilitator, couldn't, couldn't make any sense of me, but his mother was a good judge character. So I said, fine, give me your mother's address. I sent his, I sent his mother my resume. The next week at the next meeting, he walks by me and says, my mom says you're okay. <laughs> you <know? laughs> So now, but what, what it was, you know, and, and he became then a wonderful ally within the meeting. But again, what enabled me to do it, it was a different conversation. Because it, it could have ended badly. But because I was able to, again, bracket my defensive reaction long enough to get curious, it had a different outcome, a different result. That's the same thing that in terms of where we all get emotionally triggered in very different ways. What's key then is not to control the emotion as it is to understand and become reflective on what is it about me that gets triggered. And again, could it be one of these rather than an actual attack? So lastly, we get run down by our quick thinking. I mean, our thinking is amazingly quick. It helps us make sense of our experience. But again, as I've hopefully been able to demonstrate, it's vulnerable to errors. And we miss stuff. We can see the same thing, but interpret it very differently, as, as we saw with the case of the, of the famous picture of the old woman, young woman. And we tend to see our conclusions as factual and obvious. So tomorrow, I'll be talking more about how to put into use a metaphorical tool that Chris Ardu has created called the Ladder of Inference. I'm not going to have time to go into it today, but there's a lot of research on it. If you Google this, you know, you're going to see a lot. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to talk about, we're, we're going to actually do some exercises as to how to, how to actually put it in, in, into practice. But basically, again, if anyone's familiar with logic, it's basically we're, we are natural inductive reasoners. And we see something particular and we draw generalizations. So a good productive business conversation is are you able to, in a sense, walk down the ladder to be able to share the data, the information that you're using as a basis of your reasoning and how you're interpreting it to the conclusion that you reach. By doing so, you become much more precise in your language. You become much more compelling in your point of view. Okay. Hey, we're doing pretty good. Got about four, four minutes to wrap it up. So uh, looking to see how these pieces of the puzzle fit together. Here's where, where to begin. Change in terms of your own thinking is likely if you see how your own actions contribute to the problem. By the way, that's great marital advice too. You know, <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> Change is likely if you begin to use good questions and inquire into others' views in order to generate insight and reasonableness. I, I tell you, I, I, I'm so struck by, I mean, I don't know about you, but there's no shortage of stuff going on in my head all the time. And I would imagine that's true for you, and if it's true for you, then it's true for everybody in, in the room. If that's the case, then spend some time getting to know each other's world. And it was that great article you saw in the New York Times with Google, and they mentioned a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Amy Edmondson at the Harvard Business School, that did all this research about teaming, what makes high-performance team. Basic, basic thing, get to know each other. Try to understand what's it like to live in the world that you live in. 
Because if you're able to do that, then you're able to see the reasonableness in the person's actions. And if they are making an error, if they are doing something that's creating difficulty, then you're in a position to help them. Mistakes are not something to be punished. They're puzzles. You don't get mad at a puzzle that's all in different places. You try to figure out how they all fit together. That's the same with our own human interactions. And again, the real trick is to try to be able to see in terms of that loop of these adaptive patterns of how all parties seek to understand how they're interacting together to create an undesirable result. My fa favorite phrase of Chris Arduous is organizations are social devices that turn dilemmas into intergroup conflict. At the heart of every co personal conflict, interpersonal conflict that I have to facilitate, negotiate, be a part of, there's a dilemma. And dilemmas, by their nature, dilemmas prevent rival perspectives from reaching an outcome completely satisfier to either view. In the end, there's a need to balance the rival perspectives in untidy circumstances. I think of dilemmas as the Chinese finger trap, okay? They aren't, the dilemmas aren't really resolvable. That's by their nature. They're perennial organization tensions that exist, exist here and every other organization that I've been uh, a part of. They have to be managed. If you pull on both ends, just like the Chinese finger trap, things get worse. They don't get resolved. They get, you, you start seeing an escalation of tension. How do you get out of a Chinese figure trap? You move towards each other. If you move towards the end of the trap and you actually then can get out. And that's again my final thought to share with you is that really it's that moving together as just wonderful human beings that we are to try to understand our better, our, our, ourselves better and the worlds that we live in.